but let's get into God's Word. Uh, we're going to talk about brotherly kindness today. We're not going to look at the Old Testament like we've been doing. God gave me this message a few weeks ago and gave me the opportunity to uh, prepare it this last week since Chris and I both were wondering, do we have work? Do we not? Do we have work? Do we have not? You know, so Chris and I agreed, let's both prepare <laughs> and whoever doesn't have to work will preach. He said, okay, let's do that. So he's got a sermon in his pocket, so. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Mitaki. Lord, we appreciate the place called Mitaki where we can gather within these walls with this cool air, these nice seats. But, Lord, we pre appreciate the body here, the fellowship here. Those who have gone on to other places around the world, Australia, back to the States, to Europe, always write back and tell us how they miss the work you're doing here at me talking, Lord. And we, we realize that today, as some of us, some of our brothers and sisters are away on vacation or have just recently moved back to their countries or to another place where they are working. But Lord, you, you bring new brothers and sisters to, to be with us, to comfort us and for us to comfort them. And we thank you for your very special ministry you do here in the body at Mitaki. We ask that you open up our hearts Open up our minds to receive your word today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, brotherly kindness. You know, I, I put this picture up here of my dog and another border collie we met at Kintai. Uh, oh, I don't know, what, a year, year and a half ago maybe? And uh, since they, they look so cute together, actually my dog wanted to eat the other dog and... I had to threaten him to take this picture. He listens really well when I, when I make him be kind. He's usually very kind, but he really wanted to grab the other Border Collie. But I think the other Border, border Collie was younger and faster, so Jazz would have had a harder time, although Jazz did have a nice trim haircut. We're going to look at Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. All right. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Amen. God's Word. You know, I, if you're thinking about starting a little Bible study or you have a, a chance to teach just a little tiny lesson somewhere along the way to somebody, I would recommend this passage. You can really work on this passage for a long time just to let you know that we're, we're going to go all the way down to brotherly kindness and study today, but there are so many good points that the body of Christ needs to look at in just this very short passage. So as we read the Word of God, let me encourage you to take your time reading it. Chew on it slowly. Think about it. Meditate on it. Reread it. Compare it. I wish that you would have a few great passages that you keep in your heart throughout the year, as I've told my Bible study group rather than reading through the whole Bible in a year and getting nothing from it. Get those good passages of Scripture, more than the verses, but the verses are important too. Get those three or four verses of gold nuggets and meditate on them, focus on them, think about them, apply them to your life, compare them, let them be the standard that you measure your Christian walk with. Now, I went to the New International Version 
2011 edition and read this, and I was going, wait a minute, that's not what I've been reading. That's kind of interesting. So I did my little switch on Bible Gateway and went up to the New International Version 1984 edition, and it said what I thought it said. In verse 7, where it has but brotherly kindness in the 2011 version, it is tried to be, they've tried to be, really worked very hard to be um, gender friendly, and they've changed brotherly kindness to mutual affection. Mutual affection here. And I thought, hmm, the mutual's okay, but the affection part, I'm, you know, there's all kinds of affection. And I'm not so sure that's what the Bible is intending here. So, and anyway, for what we could put brotherly and sisterly kindness here, the, the Greek goes okay with that, but mutual affection, I don't know. So, okay, so today we're going to look at make every effort to add to your faith brotherly kindness. Let's go back one. So, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. Make every effort to add to your faith knowledge. Make every effort to add to your faith self-control. Make every effort to add to your faith perseverance. Make every effort to add to your faith godliness. And then, of course, brotherly kindness and love. So there's something about when we come into the faith of Christ that we still have to work with God to add to what he has done in our life to become more like Christ. So there's something there that Peter is saying, make an effort and make a hearty effort, make a bold effort to live and work with Christ so that your faith will become complete with all these other things. Today, we're going to talk about brotherly kindness. Make every effort. Do your best. Work with God hand in hand. Keep your eyes on Him. Stay focused on Him because... Just getting saved is not what God wants you to do. I mean, let's just get saved and no longer grow. Let's just get saved and not do all these other things, not add to our spiritual life what God intends us to. It will be a very lonely faith, I'm afraid. And it would just be so sad to not grow the way Christ intended us to go, grow. I think the Heavenly Father is trying to get us to look something like His Son in our spiritual walk. So that means we have a lot of growing to do, doesn't it? Does anybody th- out there think, oh, I'm getting up right up there pretty close to Jesus. I don't have too much. No, I don't think so. Karen, put your hand down. Oh, okay. <laughs> so what is this brotherly kindness that the Bible's talking about here? Well, the, the actual Greek word is Philadelphia. It's very interesting that the, the city of bro- brotherly love now, Philadelphia, is uh, sadly one of the, uh, has one of the top crime rates in the United States at this point. Maybe one of the, uh, I think they're in the top three in murder rates. So, you know, the name, they're not living up to the name, I'm sad to say. But it's the same word, and it comes from a couple of Greek words. One is phileo, which is love. One of the Greek words for love, there are several. And this one comes from the word philos. And after, after the Bible study, Pastor Hiroshi is going to get me in the corner and say, Kevin, you murdered the Greek in there. But um, it comes from philos. And the word philos basically means to, to be friendly, uh, to be a good companion. You know, it's a companionship kind of love. It's not necessarily the love that well, God has for us. That's a different kind of love. And it's combined, phileo is combined with adelphos, which means a brother or a sister. Um, you know, the original writers of the Greek didn't have to be so politically friendly in that day. So they just, you know, put the first word up there and they assumed anybody would... No, it doesn't just mean brother. It also can mean sister, uh, an associate, someone that you're joined with in a bond of some kind, which, you know, a work associate even would fit there. But it's more uh, along the lines of blood-related. 
and somebody that you have a very common interest with. And this word phileo and is not used, though, to express love to God or from God. That's a different kind of love, and we all know what that is. That's agape or agapao, right? Different kind of love. So we're talking about love between us. Love between somebody you have some connection with. Love between the people you live and work with. And especially in today's lesson, we're going to be talking about love between Christian brothers and sisters. Well, somebody once asked me a long time ago, well, and it's, it's true, I have this in my family back in America too, well, you know, I don't have to love my real brother like that, do I? <laughs> And then their brother got saved, and I said, now what are you going to do? Huh? What's the other thing you going to do? I said, it's actually double now. You've got two responsibilities. You're responsible to love your real brother, and now your brother has gotten saved, so you really got to love him. So guess what? As part of God's family, when we say yes to Jesus Christ, when we believe in him as our Savior, that he rose from the dead, when we believe that in our heart, and we confess him before other people. We become part of God's family. That's a wonderful thing. We are adopted into God's family. When we become, when we become a Christian, we are adopted into God's family for better or for worse. I wish people would say that when they lead somebody to the Lord. Because I know so many people who got disappointed when they got into the church and they found all these strange people. I'm talking about you and me. <laughs> they thought, oh, I would get in here and there wouldn't, there would be, everybody would be perfect and there'd be a little halo around there and they'd be walking straight and they'd be on time. You know, my mom is a, a dear little woman. She's about this big and she's 82. And the other day I, I said, hey, did you hear about this certain thing? And she said, yeah, it's terrible. I said, well, why don't you try praying about it? And she said, I pray. Don't start on me. I pray to God in my own way, and I don't go to church. And I, I'm softening how she said it. My mom has flowery language. And she said, I pray. I believe in God. I ain't going to that church, none of those churches with all those hypocrites. That's my mom's religion. That's not the Bible's teaching on what happens when you get saved. Yeah. I told my mom once, man, everybody in there is messed up. I said, yeah, we are. That's why we go. Come on. You're well, I'm not messed up like them. So anyway. <laughs> yeah. Guess what? When you come into God's church, you don't get to choose who your brothers or your sisters are. Well, that one and that one and that one, but not, not that one. And guess what? Again, you don't get to choose whether you love them or not. It's not optional. Sure is quiet out there. You are adopted into God's family. Just like you are, God brings you into his family. And when you get there, there's a bunch of people that are just as messed up or even more messed up than you are or were. But it's God's family. Thank God. You don't have to be perfect to get in here. Amen? Ah, who would get in? Jesus would be here all by himself. Maybe Pastor Hiroshi. I don't know. <laughs> Ah, it's not a choice. Loving our brothers and sisters, hanging out with our brothers and sisters is not an option. 1 John 2, 9, anyone who claims to be in the light, and when we come to Christ, it's, this weird, it's talked about us coming into the light, the, the true Word of God. We come out of the darkness and into the light, and if we say we have become a Christian, if we are in the light, and we don't want to fellowship with that person, we just will not go to church where that Christian is, then we have to examine ourselves. Are we really in the faith? Did we make a verbal commitment to Christ, or did we really make a, 
life commitment, with our whole being, with our whole heart. Pretty harsh words by the gospel writer of John. Uh, John, uh, John also wrote the gospel, but in this letter of First John, if you want to read it when you have time, it'll it'll paint the picture quite clearly for you that love is not an option in God's church. I think there are three inseparable things in the the relationship that we find ourselves in when we become a Christian. You know, there are th three inseparable things here in Japan, too. When you cook in Japan, there are three things that you have to have. You have to have shoyu, soy sauce, sugar, uh, I'm sorry, sake, and meeting. Meeting is a kind of sweet wine, right? Are those three right? Three inseparable things. I don't know. When I watch these Japanese cooking programs, they say, what'd you put in there? A soy sauce? Oh, yeah, that's a surprise. Sake? Mmm, surprise number two. And meeting, oh, okay, mm, my, my, yeah, it is, it's good. In Louisiana, we have that too, and we, you know, we have uh, the, it's almost sacrilegious, but we talk about the Holy Trinity in Cajun cooking, and I wish Diana was here so she could tell you, she'd answer right away. We have onions, garlic, and green peppers, and some people like to add a fourth uh, part to the Trinity, a celery. So we, you know, what are the, did you put the three ingredients in your Cajun food? Of course, I'm Cajun, and I'm French. I'm from Louisiana. Garlic, celery, no, garlic, green peppers, and onions. Three inseparable things. In Amer most Americans, right? Mom, apple pie, and baseball kind of things, you know. Here's the three inseparable things that happen that you find yourself in when you come into, when you're adopted into the body of Christ. You can't separate the church from brotherly kindness. You can't say I'm a member of the body of Christ or of the family of God and not fellowship. They go hand in hand. I'm talking as though you're not here. I know you're here and you're here for fellowship. But sometimes we think we can be Lone Ranger Christians. We cannot do that. You cannot survive as a Christian without coming and being with God's people somewhere, sometime, somehow. You have to go to Bible study. You have to come to church. You have to go to choir practice. You have to do something. You have to go to Starbucks and sit around with some Christians. It's just necessary. And through doing all this, when you're with other people, you'll find other believers. You'll find yourself wanting to, needing to be kind to them and show that affection. You can't separate these. Impossible. Well, what is the church? The Greek word is ecclesia, the body of believing people. It's not a building. It's not a denomination. It's not the assemblies of God, although I think you know, assemblies of God are pretty good. It's not the First Baptist Church. It's not the Southern Baptist Church exclusively, although those organizations are good, and I have friends, and we have people from, I don't know, how many people are there here? There's probably 20 or so. There's probably 20 groups represented here, except Pastor Hiroshi and I are maybe the only two of the same, belong to the same church. Everybody else is different, and that's good. So the church is the representation of all who truly believe in Jesus Christ. Well, what is brotherly kindness? We talked about that. It's Philadelphia. Love between love and special affection between uh, associates, between brothers, between sisters, and especially between brothers and sisters in Christ. And today I want to focus on, as we try to understand this brotherly kindness aspect of our Christian walk, I want to focus on fellowship, koinonia, is the word that we have heard before. We've actually heard and seen bulletins, uh, Coin and Nina Fellowship a Group is meeting at 8 o'clock on Wednesdays. You know, and they usually meet in the basement because some of them raise their hands, you know, and stuff, you know, get a little wild. But Koinonia actually means fellowship. Koinonia is a oneness that is only possible through God's supernatural power. 
sometimes it's really hard to translate this word, and it's been translated basically fellowship. It also means communion. We had communion today, or we will, I'm sorry, we had it in the earlier service. We'll have it later when, when I'm done flapping my jaws. Um, communion is uh, communicating with others in the most intimate way. It's sharing the Lord's Supper. It's saying in your heart, in the body of believers, that I remember what Jesus Christ did for me individually, and you are making a statement of faith by taking communion. That's part of what koinonia is. When you can stand in front of anybody, in front of all these brothers and sisters and say, I remember that Jesus Christ died for me. I remember he gave his body and blood to wash away my sins, to set me free. When you can do that, you are having koinonia fellowship. You are experiencing koinonia. Another thing that koinonia means is sharing. Sharing your life, sharing your time, sharing your money, sharing your emotions with other believers. Could be translated sharing. Participation. This is one that is neglected way too much. Taking part in what the church is doing. Coming to church and doing something. Putting away the Bibles. Putting out the Bibles. Turning on the air conditioner. Turning on the lights. Sweeping the floor. Playing the piano. Teaching, preaching, encouraging, comforting. Participating in what the body does. Not being a fan. When I go to the watch the carp play, I participate in yelling. That's all. That's all. I don't get out there and swing a bat. You know, I, they wouldn't want me to. They'd have me arrested. You know, I can go to the baseball field and just watch. I can be an observer. But you can't come to church and just be an observer. That's not, you're not actively doing koinonia when you just observe. It's participation. Koinonia is our participation together in the life that we have from God through Jesus Christ. That's what koinonia is. Life that we share in Christ is ecclesia. That's the real, it happens in church. It's what we do. So it's connected. You can't separate these. Remember those, those three things that can't be separated. Well, I'm, I'm so glad Edmer mentioned uh, we're having a potluck next week, and I didn't know, so it's going to come up here. <laughs> Koinonia is much more than having snacks downstairs after worship and teaching up here. But we want you to go downstairs and fellowship. That's part of it. But it's more than that. We're going to have some snacks. We're going to have some drinks down there. And people pray for each other down there. And I've seen people read their Bible before. I remember Pastor Hiroshi and I standing against the wall a few years ago going, man, look at all of that. There's people praying over there. Look at that guy's guitar over there. I said, did you teach him what this is? And he said, no, that's just, that's just fellowship happening without any leadership getting in the way. And it's important to do that. Recently, Pastor Chris has been encouraging the body here to stay up here after church. Stay here. Pray for one another. Share scripture here. Come up here. Pastor Hiroshi said this morning, I've never seen anybody run up the aisle and throw themselves on the floor at God's mercy up here. Why not? Yeah, why not? Come on. You know, after we go down for fellowship, say, no, I don't have enough of God. You guys go down in fellowship. Come over here. Fall on the floor before God. Call your brothers and sisters and say, don't go down there. Stay here with me. That would be good. It's more. That, that's koinonia too. It's more than a potluck at the Smile House. Just bring drinks next week. <laughs> it's also that. It's also that. The house of smiles is another thing we call that. It's more than that, but it is that too. It's more than hanging out with other believers just because they're culturally similar to you. Aren't we comfortable around the people we are like? With, we want to be with people we think like. People we are politically similar to. 
emotionally similar to, speak the same language, move the same way, eat the same things. That's good. And there's a, a place for that in the body of Christ. But that's not all Koinonia is. Midori and I support uh, and love a church in San Diego. It's called the San Diego Japanese Community Church. Uh, Japanese Christian Church. It's a wonderful small body of believers who supported our son when he was there. They have great Bible studies, great teachers there. And there's a place for that too, but that's not all it is. You need to mix it up because when we get to heaven, there's not going to be your little pockets of fellowshipping with just the believers you can get along with. It's going to be everybody all together. This is a good uh, you know, example of what heaven's going to be like. How many countries and cultures do we have represented here? A lot. And that's good. And that's what heaven's going to look like. Koinonia is not simply, it's much more than simply attending a Bible study or church service and then making a quick, quick exit. Oh, get in just in time to hear the sermon. Sermon's done. Gone. <laughs> well, okay, you got something to do. That's fine. But sometimes you got to hang around with your brothers and sisters. Somebody might need you to pray for them. Somebody might need you to comfort them. Yes, we all want to be comforted. We all need somebody to shake our hand and say, How you doing? What's up? But somebody might need to hear from you. Somebody might need you to put your arm around their shoulders and say, Hey, I've been thinking about you. That's koinonia. The koinonia fellowship that I'm trying to make clear to, to myself and to us today is the type that brought Jews and Gentiles together. Enemies for centuries. No political persuasion, no conferences, no meetings, no summits could get them to agree. But koinonia, life in Christ, brought these enemies together as the body of Christ. Jews and Gentiles coming together, eating together, staying at one another's home. We just studied in our Wednesday study where Peter went to the home of Cornelius and he stayed there with them. He stayed with those Gentile believers after the Holy Spirit fell on them, just like on the day of Pentecost. And then, but it caused friction, right? When the, the Jewish Christian leaders back in Jerusalem heard that Peter was staying with Gentiles, they called him back and said, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> right? He said, I'm fellowshipping. I went there. I prayed for them. The Holy Spirit fell. And all the leaders at Jerusalem said, oh, all right, praise God. That's what it's about. That's koinonia. That's koinonia. Those who had separated each other and wouldn't speak to each other for years, centuries, were now united in worship together in the early church. And that was the greatest expression of koinonia, I think, that we have in the New Testament. Well, what is koinonia, that fellowship? It is essential for us, I think. If you want to be a growing believer, koinonia is essential to your growth as a believer in Christ. Koinonia is essential for us to be a healthy body of believers. Absolutely necessary. We want to reach out to our community as God intends. We must fellowship with one another. We must have that intimate, good fellowship. We must spend time one another, with one another. Why? Because the world's watching us. Those who are not believers, when they see us getting along, when they see you coming here on Sundays, when they hear you talk about, what did you do last Sunday? Hey, I went to church. Hey, again? I mean, it's not Easter or anything. You know. Well, no, but Christmas is coming. Want to go? Ah, what do you do there? Oh, we sit around, we laugh, we pray for each other, the pastor preaches, I play the piano, you know. 
great opportunity to share Christ because you are fellowshipping. Someone named William Temple wrote, the church is the only cooperative society in the world that exists for the benefit of its non-members. Part of the reason we exist is for the world to see us and for us to get together, get strength, pray for one another. Paul said, pray for me that I can preach the gospel more effectively. And that's what he did. And he did it when he was fellowshipping. If you are to add to its koinonia, fellowship is essential. If you're to add to your faith, brotherly kindness. Absolutely necessary. I wrote up here, real koinonia fellowship produces light, but I, I think I'd like to alter that. I think it, it produces an environment where light can grow and multiply. And let's look at what John what wrote in 1 John chapter six, uh, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Is that right? Chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Okay. If we claim to have fellowship with him, with God, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Okay. Well, okay. Then that's not me. Okay. Fine. You know. Move on to verse 7. But if we walk in the light, yeah, we're believers. I walk in the light. Oh, sorry. As he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. So it's a natural thing. What I'm trying to say is you don't have to work and strive to do all these things. If you're walking in the light of God, you will want to fellowship with one another. You want to be with other people. You'll be glad you found this expression of the body here on this hill. And boy, it's hard to get up here in the summer. <laughs> it's hot. But when you get here and you've got brothers and sisters around you and they're talking about Jesus and they're talking about the worship songs and praying for one another, you will have fellowship. The blood of Jesus Christ purifies us from all sins. It's not a result. That's what's happening when we do this. If we're in the light, his blood is cleansing us already. And we'll want to have fellowship. We'll walk in that light. And if we're truly in the light, we'll be experiencing true fellowship. Real koinonia fellowship produces an, uh, provides an environment that produces acceptance. Are there... Well, let me, let me just say matter-of-factly, there will always be some believers in the body of Christ that rub us the wrong way. We will not always be able to get along with every person like we get along with this person. Cultural differences, different hobbies, you know, different things in the way we were raised as children. There will always be those things. But the Bible is clear in if we are believers, we are to make an effort to live with one another in the body of Christ. We have to accept one another regardless of where we are socially or racially or culturally. We are not given the option to, you know, click certain boxes and then, no, I'm not clicking these. I don't, you know, I don't deal with them. Romans chapter 12, be devoted to one another in love. Accept one another. Honor one another. Above yourselves. That's the hard thing, isn't it? Well, I'm not like her. Thank God I'm not like him. Well, Jesus warned us of those things. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud. Be willing to associate with whoever is in the body of Christ. You cannot accept and choose, pick and choose your brothers and sisters. People of low position. Wow, I, I don't even see how Paul wrote that, you know. <laughs> how do we do that? Well, he's of low position. I'm not going to associate. It just shouldn't even be in our thinking. We should accept anybody and everybody. We've had people come to this church from all walks of life. 
one of the best testimonies in my church in this that I've ever heard in this church over the I don't know how long have I been here 30 ah, 28 years man 28 years in this church I heard a guy say, come up and say, and you hear these testimonies, and I've told Pastor Hiroshi this testimony. He said, I'm so surprised to see rich people in this church coming, getting saved and fellowshipping. I thought only poor people got saved. And you usually hear the opposite, right? Right? He was just so glad. That God was saving people on the, you know, we're talking about a high position, but people up here sitting right next to people who had no money. And nobody knew who had the money and who had the position. He was just so thrilled when he found out that people of higher status, whatever that is, were up here testifying. Thank God for saving me. And they're so successful and so wealthy, but God did it. Acceptance. Real koinonia fellowship produces giving. What kind of giving? Well, we already had the offering. I should have waited, huh? Not talking about that so much. But let's take a look. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. And I use the New Living Translation here. I just liked it a little better. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So... We also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Let me just ask you a question. How are you going to give up your life for your brother and sister if you're not fellowshipping with them? If you're not going to where they are? Impossible. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, Let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show it. Do something. Let us show the truth by our actions. That's what coinage fellowship is. When you get together, you don't just stand around, see your brother's need, you see your sister's need and do nothing. When you see somebody hurting, when they have a need, you go to them. If you're able, go to them. Or if you have a need, come here. Come see me. Grab somebody who looks like they can help you. A need in the church today. Some young guy was going, where's Pastor Hideko? I need to find her. Simple thing, but he looked so desperate. Hiroshi was busy, and he said, Kevin, okay. So when we found her, and he looked all happy, and she looked happy, and simple things could be big things. Don't underestimate the importance of fellowship. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth so we will be confident when we stand before God. And our last point, real koinonia fellowship produces unity. The point before, brotherly kindness being in the back of our minds as we talk about You know, if we have some way to help someone, whether it's financial means, emotional support, whatever, that's a real expression of your brotherly kindness. Now, unity. I have to check. I'm using a new system in my computer, and I keep looking, but it's working. (laughs) Psalm 133 is a great psalm. How good and pleasant It is when God's people live together in unity. When God's people fellowship. When God's people do koinonia. How good and pleasant it is. God is pleased. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon. It is as if the Jew Hermon were falling on Mount Zion where the Lord bestows his blessings, even life forevermore. What is this? Okay, well, Aaron was a priest. Uh, Moses and Aaron worked together, and Aaron was a priest, and he didn't cut his hair, and he had this long beard that he didn't cut. And in the day 
in that day, olive oil was scented. You can get some today, lemon, other citrus that grow in that area, uh, incense kind of things, and they would pour it on the head of the priest or the prophet to anoint them, and they had God's anointing. The olive oil was a symbol of the Holy Spirit, and it was anointing them, and it was in unison with them because it would stick. I don't have any hair, so it's hard for you to imagine that, but, you know, it, it, it would get through the hair follicle, all the way to the follicles, and it would run down, and it would glisten, and, and they would smell so good, and it would get in the beard, and it would just be there for a long time, and they didn't shower a lot. So in the beginning, it smelled great, but later on, it didn't smell so good. And you knew who the priest was and who the prophet was because, oh, there he comes. But the point is, is that anointing of God on the priest of God, on the person of God, the unity between God and man was indicative. The Holy Spirit was on him and in him, in a sense. Unity, together, God and man, together, working together. And Mount Hermon, the granite mountain, Mount Zion, sorry, Mount Zion, the immovable mountain, covered with the delicate, glistening dew. Such a contrast, but unity together, the immovable God and His refreshing springs, His living water poured out, sprinkled out on that mountain. That's how pleasing it is. The contrast, the Holy Spirit and man, God immovable, the dew from heaven is giving us that picture of God's life, God's blessing forevermore. That's how beautiful it is when we fellowship and we have unity in the body of Christ. So why is Peter so insistent? Peter, we have to realize who wrote this, right? Peter didn't get along with many people in the beginning. Gradually, Peter became a person who understood all this. As the Holy Spirit filled him and changed his life, he understood the importance of showing brotherly kindness. He wasn't too interested in brotherly kindness early on. But after he'd written his first letter, then in his second letter, he said, make every effort. It's so important. It's critical in your walk for the Lord, with the Lord, to add to your faith. You are standing on the rock in your faith. You're secure. Don't, don't doubt that. But there's some things you still need to add to your faith. And one of them is brotherly kindness. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Father, please strengthen us to not be stagnant in our faith, but Lord, give us the wisdom and the means to add to our faith the brotherly kindness that your word teaches us. Lord, let us not neglect fellowship. Let us be accepting of those around us. Let us live in the body of Christ in unity. Father, change us so that we will be willing to consistently make efforts to add to our lives the fruit that you would have had. And in abundance, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.